No one knows why hotels are said to attract ghosts, but according to legends and the stories of staff and guests, they do. The haunting tales passed along from guest to guest tell of spirits who have struggled from beyond the grave to right some wrong. There are also those with unanswered questions. Most perceive them as a sudden cold or chill that races down the back. Those with unfinished business. Some feel it when the hair literally stands up on the back of their neck and those for whom death came too soon. It's a cold that people describe as going straight to the bone. Late at night, in strange hotel rooms, lost souls are said to be reawakened, and anything is possible. Haunted hotels are full of legends. Part of the fun of spending the night in a ghostly castle or haunted inn is hearing a tale sure to make you leave the lights on. But behind every hotel ghost story is a ghost. Many are tragic. I've actually heard of very few happy ghosts, very few uh, singing children. Hotels said to have ghosts often retain memories of unhappy events. You've got the unfinished business, you've got the violence, you've got the emotion, all right there. And so it's no wonder that they're haunted. California's Hotel del Coronado has been a popular place to get away since 1888. So why is it that after just one night, some guests want to flee? I don't know if I would ever, I, I, in fact, I know I would never stay in that room again. Over the years, the resort has attracted movie stars and heads of state and has been the backdrop for films, commercials and TV dramas. One of Dell's most glamorous guests was Marilyn Monroe, who was here to film Some Like It Hot in 1958. Luminaries find the hotel's island setting hard to resist. The Hotel Dell is beautifully situated right across the bay from San Diego. We have a beautiful stretch of pristine beach, which was pretty much set aside by the men who built the hotel. Another key to the seaside hideaway's popularity is its oddly intriguing design. The hotel's architecture is Queen Anne Revival, which is characterized by a very asymmetrical design, lots of turrets, lots of dormers, lots of towers. But the architecture is hardly the most unusual thing about Hotel del Coronado. It all started over a century ago with the arrival of a mysterious guest. She came in 1892. She arrived on November 24th, which was actually Thanksgiving evening that year. She checked in alone, which was rather unusual. She did not have luggage. Signing her name as Lottie Bernard, the woman checked into what is now room 3327. As soon as she arrived, she drew attention. They said she was acting a little erratically, uh, seemed very unhappy, distraught. She spent a lot of time in her room. One thing about the secretive guest was evident. She seemed to be very ill. She was in great pain. She told everyone she had stomach cancer. But all that she would accept from the concerned hotel staff was a little whiskey. She was truly sick, but any 
overture by the hotel to help her see a doctor, or she rebuffed. From the day she arrived, she told everybody that her brother was a doctor, so she said, and that he would be joining her, and not to worry, because it would all be taken care of when her brother got here. And every day she would go down to the front desk and say, have, have you heard from my brother? Is there any word at all? And there never was. Finally, on a moonlit night, the lonely young woman found an end to her pain. Five days after she arrived here, she was found outside on the beach. Uh, she had a single gunshot wound to her head, which the coroner later determined was self-inflicted. All she left behind was a mystery. That's just where the story started. When they got to her room, there was nothing of a personal nature there. She didn't have luggage. She didn't have any papers. There was nothing to identify her except by the name she checked in under, which was Lottie Bernard, which was an alias. The unknown guest became famous before anyone even knew her name. For a long time, she was referred to just as the beautiful stranger because no one knew who she was. So they actually sketched a picture of her face. They sent it around to newspapers around the country. And eventually, someone came forward identifying her as Kate Morgan from Iowa. She was buried here in San Diego rather unceremoniously, very sadly, just this lone 24-year-old suicide victim. Kate left the world a lonely soul, but many feel she has never left the Hotel del Coronado. <sighs> Hotel del Coronado, room 3327, where a young woman, Kate Morgan, spent her last days on Earth. Guests Jennifer and Richard Rodriguez were unaware of the room's past when they arrived. We checked in, went to our hotel room, and uh, kind of settled in. There was a ceiling fan that came down from the ceiling, and it had tassels that you would pull to turn the light on or off. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see that the, the tassels started uh, moving in a circular motion, so I thought it was kind of odd. But it wasn't until after the lights went out that her husband experienced something that defied all reason. Probably about 2.30 in the morning, uh, I felt somewhat of a tug on my blankets. And at the foot of the bed was a human being uh, pulling the blankets over their head. And I closed my eyes. And when I opened my eyes back up again, it was gone. Then I heard a voice calling my name, just asking me to come over to the people. Look outside. Oh, Richard, come to the people. Come to the people, Richard. I stayed up for the rest of the night. I um, woke up in the morning, and um, he was sitting up um, just staring ahead, and he said, um, did you see that last night? The bell gentleman came up. The first thing he said to us when he walked in the room was, how was it to sleep in the haunted room? Strange things have been said to happen in Kate's room, even in broad daylight. I would not want to stay in that room because I have talked to enough people that I believe that things do go on there, and I, I really wouldn't enjoy um, experiencing any of them. Inexplicable experiences at the Hotel Dell aren't confined to Kate Morgan's room. In another room, there's been a lot of uh, what can be characterized as poltergeist activity.
things move of their own accord, lights turn on and off, things fly across the room. That's not really activity that we can sort of characterize as being related to anyone in particular, but um, it goes on there nonetheless. The room has been known to cause alarm even at the highest levels. When George Bush was vice president, he was visiting here and had a lot of Secret Service here. One of his Secret Service men was staying in the room where there's been a lot of poltergeist activity going on. Late at night, the Secret Service agent was disturbed by the sound of strange noises coming from the room above. So he called down to the front desk and he said, can you let the people upstairs know that I'm getting bothered by all this noise and could they uh, tone it down a bit? And so our front desk person had to tell the Secret Service person that he was on the top floor. There was no room above him. But according to some, all the rooms of the Hotel Dell are haunted. When I walked in the Hotel Del Coronado, I immediately felt like I was on the Titanic, and I felt energies of people uh, from probably 100 years or 80 years or whatever uh, that were kind of free-floating through the, through the actual rooms. When I stayed at the Hotel Coronado, I was able to see one event that was in the main ballroom. It was like a vortex of energy, and I sort of felt a energy floating and almost lights that traveled in a, almost like a swirling tornado vibration. The most haunting presence to take human form at the Hotel Dell still seems to be Kate Morgan, and her room is one that housekeepers will avoid. They won't go in by themselves. They'll only go in there when there's, you know, two or three of them at a time. For a time, the hotel tried to keep Kate's story under wraps. I know in the 1960s, there's correspondence in the files that the hotel was trying to put a lid on any ghost stories. Today, however, the room enjoys immense popularity. It's sort of interesting that a lot of people want to stay in the, in the haunted room. So uh, that's more a problem for us because we can't really save it for people and it's just rented out as a regular room. Perhaps Kate's forlorn soul, friendless and without refuge in life, has found a final home in the Hotel del Coronado. People have different ideas about why, why Kate still stays here. I tend to think she didn't have anywhere else to go. If walls could speak, what would the walls of a haunted hotel castle say? The foreboding ramparts of Scotland's Comloggan Castle hold countless stories of times past. It seemed to come nearer to me all the time, and there was a clanking noise in the distance, but there was nobody there at all. Seated just over the border from England, Comloggan Castle once served as a fortress where mercenary soldiers would bring hostages for ransom. The prison abounds with reminders of cruel activity. The most infamous story from Comloggan's troubled past was that of Marion Carruthers. In the 16th century, Marion's family owned the much sought after Moswold property, just a few miles from Comloggan Castle. Marion's father was Sir Simon Carruthers. Sir Simon Carruthers, a bold knight to see, had twa bonny daughters, but nae son had he. In a battle he fought, say calm and say brave, from English invaders, his country to save. This particular time, it was very um, common, almost universal in fact, for fathers to arrange the um, uh, marriages of their daughters when they were fairly young. 
Not far away was a man with a scheme. To gain Simon's lands was James Douglas's dream. It was James Douglas's greed for the coveted Moswold lands that sent young Marion's life spiraling downwards. Marriages were um, uh, really an extension of business contracts. Increasing your estate and your wealth was uh, um, uh, the goal of all families at the time. Thinking that by joining the two estates, he would provide Marion with a life of wealth and ease, Simon Carruthers chose James Douglas to wed his beloved daughter. He would not live to know how wrong he was. But sad was the day his twa lassies were told. Their feather was dead. Brave Sir Simon the Bold. James Douglas quickly moved to secure Marion's hand and her land. Marion, uh, um, a very forceful woman, decided that she would not go along with this arrangement. Rebellious Marion spurned the idea of a prearranged marriage and sought sanctuary with her uncle at Conlogan Castle. Black Douglas waxed angry, his temper was sere. He cursed and stamped, and he tore at his hair. Not only did she go against her um, family's wishes, but put herself in great danger, and also annoyed one of the most powerful families within the area. An incredibly dangerous act. Comlogan Castle became a refuge for Marion, but its walls could not protect her forever. Mary Queen of Scots eventually got involved and uh, issued a royal decree that Marion had to uh, um, uh, follow her father's wishes. The Queen's decree was final and Marion and her lands would soon belong to James Douglas. With full knowledge of Douglas's thirst for vengeance, Marion feared that she would soon be crushed under his bitter control. It was a recipe for a tragedy. Not long did she live with grief and despair. Her oppressors and greed had little to care. And on a dark night from Comlongan's grey bower, she leapt to her death from the old lookout tower. The next morning, Marion was declared a suicide. But even in death, she could not be left undisturbed. Her head, arms and legs were cut off, and parts of her body were buried in separate sites around the castle so that no one could ever find or mourn the grave. Today, many speculate Marion died not by her own hands, but by the hands of a man whose family name had been tarnished by her strong will. I don't think you really have to be a detective to work out that I was threw her off the battlements. She would have been dragged struggling and screaming and up uh, the spiral staircase to eventually to be hurled off the top of the battlements. While the truth behind Marion's suspicious death may never be known, many guests and staff say they are sure her spirit still lingers at Comlogan. It was when I was on night duty that I experienced the ghost of Comlogan. During World War II, Comlogan Castle functioned as an orphanage. Many nurses from this time have said they have caught glimpses or felt the presence of Marion's restless spirit. Somebody came and pulled the blankets off my bed one night. I woke up, put the light on, there was nobody there. So I went back down to sleep, it happened again. Each time I laid down and put the light out, somebody took the blankets off my bed. So I left the light on <laughs> until it was time to get up. I was told I mustn't repeat this to other nurses in case of frightening them. Comlogan was where Marion sought refuge to avoid her own marriage. Ironically, today many brides are drawn to the castle for a traditional Scottish wedding. There was one particular occasion where a wedding that we were conducting at the castle. The particular lady was getting ready for the wedding. She had a bracelet from her mother who was dead and uh, a watch from her father who was also dead. 
both sentimental pieces mysteriously disappeared just before the ceremony. We went upstairs and stripped the sink, took off the U-bend and uh, searched the whole room, couldn't find it. After the wedding, she went back upstairs to her room in the bedside cabinet. She found the bracelet uh, entwined around her father's watch. Some believe that the frequent reports of jewels and currency moving about Comlogan can be traced to Marion's struggle to keep her land, her most valuable possession. Most of these sightings are to do with money and jewelry. Maybe it's something to do with this uh, um, dowry. Or could it be that Marion is simply lonely and wants to make her presence known? During the night, we were preparing breakfast for the children when we heard somebody coming down the spiral staircase. There was just this sound that, you know, somebody in a long skirt coming down the stone staircase. And then when it got down to the bottom, it stopped. But there was nobody there. There was nothing to see. An eerie reminder of Marion's sad legend still remains in the grounds of Comlogan Castle, on the very spot she is said to have breathed her last. Very soon after uh, um, uh, um, Marion was declared dead, it was noticed that no grass um, grew in the spot, and still to this day, nothing grows in that uh, particular area. Poor Marion, she died for her stoutness of heart. In Douglas's black scheme, she ne'er had a part. But legend says her brave memory still shows, for in the place where she fell, green grass never grows. To the casual observer, Lloyd Hall is simply a gracious old plantation house and bed and breakfast in the heart of central Louisiana. Outside is typical of a plantation home in the south with the oaks out front and pecans and the high chimneys uh, that face each side of the house and it's a Georgian style house built roughly around 1820. The Civil War, which was the ruination of many other plantation houses, left Lloyd Hall unscathed. The Union troops came through here and spent the night uh, here on their way up to the Battle of Mansfield. When morning came, the Union soldiers departed, but one remained behind, perhaps forever. You can hear the footsteps just as clear coming down the stairs, and when you stop and listen to make sure it's what you think you're hearing, the footsteps stops, and when you start back to do whatever you're doing, the footsteps starts again. The spirit of a Union soldier named Harry first made himself known to the youngest members of Lloyd Hall's present-day family. The girls would come down at night and they would tell us all kind of ghost stories about Harry. Well, I always thought the kids had an imaginary friend. Months went by, but this imaginary friend didn't go away, and eventually the girls' story found some local support. The older people in the community, they said that yes, there was a young Union soldier. In time, the family pieced together the whole story. During the Civil War, when the Union regiment left Lloyd Hall, Harry found a reason to stay. He became enamored of the niece of the family, who was a Miss Susan Blakemore. And he really was quite smitten with her, and he opted to desert, which uh, really was uh, most unusual. During the throes and traumas of the war, two young people finding themselves together for even such a short time, it must be love at first sight. Him being a Union soldier, and I'm sure it was very exciting for them. They fell deep in love, but they had to sneak around to be together. As an enemy soldier, Harry had to remain hidden in Lloyd Hall's attic, but one night he was detected by a visiting relative. She came upon him upstairs, and through whatever means, how, how she had a gun, I don't know. The terrified woman had no idea that the Union soldier was Susan's dearest love. As they fought over the gun, the gun went off and the young soldier was killed. 
To this day, that blood stain is still on the floor in the attic of this house. Harry was buried in a shallow grave by the house. But some say he still walks Lloyd Hall. Lloyd Hall, a typical plantation house in the south, where Harry, a lovesick soldier, met his untimely death, and where he still comes by looking for his love and serenading her with the violin at midnight. Harry seems unable to relinquish the very romance that led to his death. He was in love and I guess hasn't give up on that lost love yet. The many animals around Lloyd Hall often appear to see things that are beyond human vision. Now we say is the animals are more sensible than people are, which are things like spirits in the house. We have the one cat, Pistache, that's allowed in the house, and she's looking towards the hall, and she, her eyes and body will turn as though she's following someone walking, and then in a few moments, she will look back around as though she's following someone back to the hall. So I suspect that someone has come in to check on us and found everything to be okay and decided to return wherever their place in this home is. In addition to hosting overnight guests, today the plantation is used for parties and dinners as in days gone by. Many feel this has stirred up some festive spirits. They had grand old parties here on Saturday nights. So I think maybe they were happy when we started having parties again at Lloyd Hall. But preparation for a grand dinner always seems to meet with mysterious difficulties. When we set tables, it never fails. Silverware will be missing, napkins will be gone, glasses will be moved, and we always check the tables to make certain that everything is there at everybody's setting, every piece that's supposed to be there, and it never fails. Something will be gone. Perhaps the ghosts are having parties of their own. She was alone in the house that night and woke up and she'd hear music downstairs and laughing and people like they were having a party here in the house. And when she came to the top of the stairs and she looked, but she didn't see anything. The ghosts and spirits do have a life of their own that continues here at Lloyd Hall. And most of our evenings are quiet here, so the house does become theirs. They utilize the downstairs here as they might have uh, when they lived here. Once, the festive noises were accompanied by some eerie contact. One other night, she was woke up out of a sleep. Somebody was touching her, tapping her arm. They wasn't saying anything, it was just tapping her like they were trying to wake her up. Perhaps she was just being invited downstairs to join the party. In the South, some things never change. Well, in Louisiana, our food, our hospitality, graciousness, and southern ways are, are what we're all about. That's something that I don't think has changed over the generations. As long as this house is here, you're going to hear music, you're going to hear talking, you're going to hear silverware being moved, all kinds of strange things. I think people are still have not given this house up. And as long as it's here, I feel like they would be here in some form, in some way. This house is very much theirs as well as ours. Harry's violin isn't the only ghostly instrument said to be heard at Lloyd Hall. It's just like you would run your fingers across the keys, and you hear that. And you go and look out in the hallway near the piano, and you don't see anybody. It won't be a sign of anybody. Some at Lloyd Hall have even reported being called by voices from another world. Now, this was very strange. From upstairs, you don't know from the second floor or the third floor or where it came from, just a loud echo of your name all over the house. Bella! Just as loud. And I froze in my track because I know it wasn't supposed to be anybody in the house except me that day. 
And it took me a long time before I came upstairs, made up my mind to come up here and see who it was calling. But when I came up, I did not see a thing. There are those that not only hear, but see something that they cannot explain. My daughter was here one day um, helping out in the house, and we had left her alone. She heard footsteps, and it startled her, and she looked at the staircase. Coming down the stairs, she said she could see clearly the boots coming down the stairs, and she could see the pants, and she did not wait to find out to see who it was or what it was. Lloyd Hall's kitchen is where the staff have experienced the plantation's most unusual late-night sensation. You can smell food. Now, sometimes it may be a smell like a meat, sometimes it'll smell like bread, and sometimes like cake. Those who love Lloyd Hall feel that the plantation's ghosts will remain in the old house for as long as it stands. That's the way they've always been, and I guess that's the way they'll always be. The southwest of France is home to a region bursting with castles known as the Perigot Noir. People in this area, they say that uh, when God had to put the chateau in France, he, he puts all the castle in a big uh, napkin. And when he was flying over that region, the, the, the napkins opened and a lot of chateaux fell down. But the 10th century Chateau de Romagousse is said to have one feature that sets it apart from all the rest. And when she has in her room, uh, a lady, she doesn't lie, she can, in the, during the night, uh, open the windows, put wind in the room, uh, also turn, turn the lock of the room. Chateau de Romagousse was restored in the 19th century and now operates as a luxury hotel and restaurant. For me, it looks uh, mainly like uh, the castle of Snow White and the uh, seven uh, small boys. You've got a tower, a circular tower, and you have a, a massive building against the, that tower. You have a terrace also overlooking the valley. During the 12th century, the lady of the castle was Resplandine de Reignac. Resplandine's fiance had gone with the first crusades to Jerusalem, and every day she waited by her window, always hoping to glimpse him returning from the war. At this time, the, there was no post office. The mail was not working very well, so it took about one year before she knew he was died. Resplandine was shattered when she learned her waiting was over. Her fiance would never return. Without hope and without her love, she refused all food, gazed out of her window, and willed herself to die. And she died of love, as we say in French, mourir d'amour. Since that time, uh, her phantom, the ghost, is in, in the chateau. Those who stay in the chateau overnight often hear the sound of footsteps in the corridors and on the stairs. You heard the noise from the bottom of the corridor arriving in front of your door, exactly like somebody walking. Resplandine seems unwilling to share her room and often appears displeased to find the door locked. Sometimes she turned the lock of the room, so the people in the room, they, they see the lock turning from right to left, left to right. Such nocturnal activity has alarmed guests. The last problem was with a couple, and during the night, somebody came and pinched a man on the leg, and he thought it was his wife, but it wasn't his wife. The customer was not very pleased in the morning, so we say we must stop her because of what she's going to do tomorrow. Although Resplandine apparently enjoys keeping others awake, she dislikes having her own rest disturbed. I remember one night I was working with a hammer. Each uh, knock of the hammer I was giving, there was uh, like an echo. So I stopped and I give one, I wait, I have one answer, I give two, I 
had two answers, I have get three, three answers. I say, my God, what's happening? Respondent is not happy. I suppose she wants to sleep. So I said, well, okay, I, I'm finishing. I will do that tomorrow. Bye-bye, I go to sleep, and I left. Resplandine's odd sense of humor has given rise to some frantic phone calls from guests late at night. I have the pleasure about uh, midnight to hear that the phone, uh, a very anxious and small help. And I say, please, I don't understand, say it much. And, and the lady at the, uh, at the end say, help, help. And I rush in the room and she's being me now. The windows are open. Somebody's turning. There is a man who wants to come in my room. No, madam. No, man. Just, a, just an old poor girl from the past. After a sleepless night in Roma Goose, some guests have checked out. It was a young couple of British people. They were in that room. Uh, where she loved to switch off and switch on the electricity. And during all the night, that man, he was awakened. Throughout the night, the light continued to blink on and off, on and off. So he came early uh, at the desk in the morning and he says, there is a problem uh, in this room with the electricity. You must ask to, uh, somebody to come to repair. And say, sir, no, we can't do nothing because it's the, the ghost. And he, he became white like uh, a sink, we say in French. Huh? And he said, you do straight away my bill. Uh, uh, I want to leave the hotel. It was funny because normally British people love a ghost. This one didn't, didn't like it at all. How do you make sure your guests will still be there in the morning when your bed and breakfast is thought to be haunted? In 1888, when its doors first opened in Ventura, California, the Victorian Rose Inn was a Methodist church. This is the last remaining church of its vintage in Ventura. Unfortunately, all the other ones have been torn down and eliminated years ago. The minute I saw the building, it just was so romantic. It was so beautiful. To me, it looked like a big dollhouse. Caught up in transforming the neglected church into a bed and breakfast, the new owners of the Victorian Rose didn't realize that their dollhouse might already be inhabited. As we were getting closer to opening, people would come in and mention, uh, do you know about the ghost? And I always laughed it off, and I never thought it was anything of any consequence until more and more people started seeing things, feeling things, and sensing things. So. I, I have certainly become a believer there's something other than human entities in the building. People tell lots of different stories that gives credence to the theory that this inn is one of the most haunted places in California. The spiritual atmosphere of the old church has been carefully preserved. As you walk through the um, double sets of front doors, you come into the entry, and if you would look all the way up, you could see the top of the bell tower or the steeple. As you stroll around the entry, moving into the sanctuary, you're barraged with pump organs and player pianos and a lot of religious pieces that seem to blend in and go so nicely with our motif here. But organs and pianos cannot be held responsible for the music that is heard high above the old sanctuary. Our own experiences have been constant noises upstairs. This has happened so many times that when we hear things, we don't even come upstairs anymore. The heart-rending cadences of a particular sound have been heard resonating again and again throughout the old church. We've had people walk in from outside and, and want to stay with us, and then I suggest them staying in the emperor's room, and they've said to us, no, I can't stay up there. There's somebody singing all the time. The present location of the emperor's room may give a clue to the identity of the phantom voice. The emperor's suite 
It's above the main sacristy. That was built right where the choir loft was located. The most incredible part of that bedroom is on the very top landing. You can overlook the sanctuary. And our ceilings are 26 foot high. The view from the old choir loft is heavenly, but just high enough to be treacherous. A woman was very dedicated to the church, a, a member of good standing that led the choir. She would practice with the choir in the loft above the sacristy. Until one day, the music came to a sudden and deadly stop. During the practice, she was walking back and something distracted her. For some reason, she backed up against the low railing and slipped and fell over the railing to the pews below. And there, her neck hit just right. Victoria Rose Inn, California, used to be a Methodist church and was the scene of a freak accident in the 1880s. She'd fallen any other way, she may have broken a bone but lived, but she fell just right and it snapped her neck. Today, some guests take pains to avoid sleeping in the loft of this fallen angel. We had one lady that was gonna stay with us several days she liked the idea of staying in a different room each evening. Um, I offered the emperor's suite to her as one of them, and she said she couldn't stay up there because there's somebody singing. Many guests wonder what keeps this spectral singer from finishing her song and moving on. I think she doesn't know she's dead. I think she's still trying to perform the solo she practiced so many decades ago. The bizarre happenings of the Victorian Rose have been well documented in each room's journal. The stories in those books read like, like something out of horror fiction. The most surprising journal entries seem to indicate that the owners of the Victorian Rose are not the only ones tending to the needs of their guests. We've had people that remember a figure, and it always is the same slender, balding man with a black jacket on, like a minister's outfit, that seems to just watch over people and look at them. A number of our guests have said that he's tucked them in and stroked their hair. This dark figure has been described again and again by many different guests. Several different people in the same room at different times had reported the same description of the man. The owners of the inn feel there's no reason for concern. There is a roaming minister that actually takes care of our guest. He just seems to view them and, and make sure they're all okay and, and leaves after a short while. Not all the guests appreciate such personal contact. One of our guests would hide under the covers because the ghost would approach him and he didn't want to deal with it. I mean, we're talking about a full-grown man just hiding and shaking. The mysterious minister seems to be searching for a flock to tend. No one says this is an evil ghost. In fact, if anything, he seems to be quite helpful and interested in people's dilemmas and problems. Perhaps he's trying to continue his calling in the afterlife. It seems like people get trapped in some state of limbo. For some reason, the minister feels like he has to still stay here and take care of his congregation. No one knows the minister's history, but he may have had a tragic ending of his own. It's possible that he died um, before his time. It could be that he doesn't know he's dead. He is continuing his work, planning to just remain behind for just a while longer, not knowing that it has been many decades. Can it be that using the old church for secular purposes has stirred up its spirits? 
keeping in mind this was a church for 70 years, really wasn't set up to be a, a place to live in or sleep in. So I, I think some of these experiences probably have happened because we've changed the use of the building. It's no longer a house of prayer. Although no longer a place of worship, some feel the Victorian Rose still fulfills a spiritual need. I know a lot of people have become believers once they leave here that there's something else in the world other than a human aspect. Whether they reveal their presence through music or mischief, hotel ghosts all seem to ignore the dimension of time. When a person tunes in, on the other side, it's 80 years, 2,000 years, 60 years. It doesn't matter if something horrific happened or something unknown stayed in that specific room. You feel that. I think that some ghosts are linked to the fabric of time. I believe that there's, a, you might say, holes or warps in time. And occasionally, just rarely, we can see into the past.